Hello everybody, I hope you're doing well today. It is time for episode 2 of the Art of Swapping series, and today we are going to be going over menu setup. So we usually, when we start up the game, are going to have an inventory that looks like this. Well, there's no usually about it. When you boot up the game, it's going to be based on item type. But the thing is, is that the option that you want to be working with is order of acquisition, and then design your menu based on your preferences. So something worth going over is that everybody's preferences are going to be different but if you're new to all this then perhaps my preferences will be appealing to you so i'm going to go over all of the ideas as to why everything is in the position it is and then you can take that information and apply it how you want it we're also going to go in a specific order when it comes to which menus we're looking at first we're going to start with armor due to it probably being the most easy and digestible then we'll go to talismans and then we will move on to weapons it is also worth noting that you do not need to have a dupe stash of weapons or talismans, whatever not, to have a good menu. Just because I might have, say, 20 Crimson Seed talismans right here, by no means that you... It, it does not mean that you need it as well. So near the end of this video, I'm going to swap over to my level 80 character, where I have farmed everything legitimately, but I still have a very good menu. Now, granted, we're going to fix my weapon menu because it's kind of messed up as of right now, but we're going to go over something that was legitimately farmed. So with that being said, let's go ahead and hop right into it. Now when it comes to armor, I'm not going to get into the weeds of what is going to be the most optimal for this specific defense at this specific endurance. That's just too complex and deep of a topic for this video. What I'm mostly going to be going over is the poise breakpoints you want to meet, and then structuring your armor setup around the things that you're going to be swapping to. So essentially, I personally, the way I have it is I have my different fashions here, right here at the bottom, and then over here, all the way at the left, I have something that is able to give me 109 poise when I wear it with the Bullgoat Talisman. So the two main breakpoints that most people are going to go for are going to be something above 88 and then something above 108. So a lot of backswings when it comes to an R1 chain are going to do 88 poise damage on the second hit. There are quite a lot of second hits that do this exact amount of poise damage, so being able to go slightly higher than it is going to allow you to mash out of hit stun against somebody that goes for the second hit of a given R1 chain. And 109 poise or above is going to allow you to tank an off stock hit, because this first hit is going to do 108. Now granted, its second hit also does 108, but oftentimes what you need is to get through that first hit, because this is very hard to react to, and oftentimes it's being paired with a very problematic weapon when combined with it, such as a halberd. So being able to at least momentarily turn off the stun of this setup is extremely important. But if you're going to be like me and go with fashion, and you're just kind of throwing poise out the door, then... You know, you, you're going to have to be prepared to not be able to really tank much in terms of a second R1 or anything like that. Like, my personal favorite armor is really only going to be able to poise tank the first R1 of a dagger. And so that's really all about... That's that's just about all that this is getting through. So you, you got to choose if you want to have really high poise or really high of a specific defense. But in terms of my personal preferences, I'm almost always wearing fashion. So I'm really not the best person to educate you on what the best magic defense setup is for this amount of endurance or the specific best immunity for this uh, amount of endurance that's that's an answer that I'm not going to be able to give you. But there's going to be some practical swaps that regardless of what you're wearing, you're essentially always going to have on a character, and you should have them close by. So there are going to be two pieces of armor that are going to make your Crimson Tear heal more. So you have the Crimson Tear Scarab, and you have the Guardian Bloom Full Bloom armor. And so both of these are going to raise your Crimson Tear healing by 10%. And when you combine that with the Crimson Seed Talisman, this is going to heal an outrageous amount of HP. So you can get like about 60 to 70% of your HP back if you have max 60 Vigor or so. You can get almost all of that back in a single Crimson Tier if you combine these three pieces. So it is extremely important to have this essentially one tick away from your main armor. And then also, Royal Remains, while it is a very dishonest armor set, 
this is going to be one of the crucial parts of what's called cockroach mode. Essentially, the Royal Remains armor is going to heal you per piece 2%, I meant 2 HP per second, uh, if you are lower than 16% HP. And when you combine that with the Feather Talismans, which are going to give you extra attack and defense when below 20% HP, you can probably see why this setup is called cockroach mode it's because you become borderline impossible to kill and it is a very bad idea to recklessly aggress someone in cockroach mode because if they counter hit you with something you will probably die uh this setup is extremely dangerous and is why being at low hp oftentimes is actually not that big of a disadvantage so essentially what you're going to want to do is if you are not going to have five of every single type that you want and need I would do something kind of like this. So let me go ahead and put my armor up and I'll show you what I would do if I didn't have all of this stuff out here. Okay, so what I would do is I would make it to where my royal remains is going to be the first thing in my inventory. That way it's always consistently going to be in this direction when I go to swap my armor. Then I would put my main armor set. This for you is going to be different based on what you like to wear or what you're min-maxing for. So. Let me go ahead and add my normal fashion. That is the wrong boots. There we go. And then at the end, what I would do is I would add a Crimson Tear Scarab and a Full Bloom armor set. Now, when it comes to helmets, there's going to be a lot of different armor pieces, especially helmets that are going to give certain buffs and debuffs. So if you're trying to go for something that has like extra stats on it or say like the Ash of War Scarab, right or the incantation scarab or say like the mushroom uh the mushroom head is essentially something you should have on every single build uh then you would be putting these here as well but you're going to have it to where you have the royal remains all consistently in one direction and it's all one tick away and then also the crimson tier is going to be one tick away as well so say you need to heal pretty badly you would open your menu you would go to confirm Go down three tiles, click on one, wrong menu, go down two tiles, and then you will go left, click, bumper, left, click, bumper, right? And now you're able to heal, go back into your menu, and swap it back by hitting left on the D-pad instead. And then if you were at low HP, you could swap very quickly, like this. Now granted, I did this much slower than I'm able to, just for the sake of demonstration, but you're able to do that very quickly. But if I were to try and push this a little bit harder in terms of how fast I can do it, right? Like, you're, you're able to swap between a menu like this because of your bumpers. Your bumpers are going to move you between your different slots. It's not going to move you between all of these interchangeably. Like, if you're in the armor menu, the bumpers will move you between the armor pieces. Talismans will stick with talismans, and the weapon slots will stick with weapons. So this is going to be very helpful for being able to swap your stuff very quickly. If you were doing it like this, you would certainly die because someone has hit you by now. But being able to swap to it extremely quickly is very useful, obviously. And that's the thing that you got to understand. Regardless of which menu you're looking at, you want to make sure that your stuff is as close as possible when it comes to being able to get to the most important stuff within like one tick. Because even going as far as say two ticks or even further means that you're looking at your your menu, you're not, it's not like muscle memory, you're going to have a hard time doing it. So it is very valuable to keep things in one sense or another, one tick of way, and if you have to, two ticks away. Now when it comes to talismans, this is quite a bit more complicated because there are a ton of different talismans that are worth your time. So I'm going to try and keep it as simple as I can. So obviously you're going to have offense-based talismans and defense-based talismans, as well as ones that do something either miscellaneous or make it easier to put your build together by making you less reliant on a specific stat. So the way that I like to do it is I like to have this setup of four things all right next to each other, okay? So this will make my defense a lot higher at full HP. This will raise my maximum HP. This will raise HP, stamina, and equip load. And then the Bull Goat Talisman is going to be here if I'm using something that has hyper armor, or I swap to the Great Shield Talisman or War Jar Arsenal based on if I'm using something really heavy, 
or if I just don't have a better option in terms of defenses, in which case I'll go with the Great Shield Talisman. When it comes to these ones that are increasing a negation, these are actually nerfed in PvP. So whereas on the wiki it might say that something like this takes off like 15% of physical or 20% of physical, it's actually going to be more so like 5%. So essentially this one's shaving off 5% damage. This one is shaving off, I believe, 5% magic damage. Now the Pearl Drake is interesting because it's going to boost all of your negations except for physical, but it's gonna do it by 4%. So something I like doing is if I'm fighting someone who is say doing a lot of magic damage, I will go to both Spell Drake and the Pearl Drake, and then I have 9% magic reduction. I know these numbers don't sound large, but this is a game where people can hit you extremely hard, so even if it's not like the world's largest amount of uh, damage being shaven off, it's still, it, it's still worth your time, so definitely recommend it. Now the next thing is, is that if you've chosen to go with defensive talismans like this, I personally recommend making all of your menus that are as extensive as this one vertical. And the reason is, is because of your trigger presses. Your triggers are going to go up and down about six tiles. And this is going to make it to where you can reach something very quickly that is not very close in your menu. So say my Crimson Seed talismans. So obviously these are pretty far away in comparison to some of these other things that I have that I have as things I will swap using my D-pad. But with a single right trigger press, I'm able to get to it very quickly. This is great for when you have taken quite a lot of damage and you need to make sure that you get back up to full HP. And if you have a dupe stash, having so many as this makes it to where you can actually be at quite a lot of your different, st uh, different spots and be able to get to whatever you have, what is called a block. Something like this, while it's not a, f a complete block because this is 20 of these and a block is 25, um, it'll make it to where a trigger press is essentially what will get you to that block, which is very easy in comparison to say, oh, I need to go down eight tiles to be able to get to my talisman. No, you can just click the, the trigger once or twice, and there you go, you're at what you need to get to. And so the way that I have it done is that I have all of my defensive talismans in one of a couple places. I have my starting lineup of talismans, these obviously being more defensively minded. But once I've taken damage, what I will do is I will swap to my more offensively minded talismans. So this can be the insignias right here, right? These are going to increase my consecutive attack damage. Or I might decide to swap to the Godskin Swaddling Cloth. The reason that this can be really good is that it's going to make it to where you get a little bit of HP back even when you Phantom hit your opponent. So against latent players, that can, this can be quite nice. Then I'm also going to have some of the different talismans like Spear, Hammer, Dagger, Claw Talisman. And yeah, it's, it's really good, needless to say. I can swap to Ritual Sword Talisman very quickly from my Shield Talisman. Say I believe that I will be able to get more use out of it because I'm shooting someone at range or something like that. Well, this is just going to be a straight damage upgrade in that case, so it's definitely worth your time. And then the reason that I have every single version of a Amber Medallion right here, this is kind of overkill. Um, but the reason I have it is because I utterly despise people throwing fan daggers at me. And so if someone throws a fan dagger, and the reason that they would do that is because they want your shield talisman to be effectively turned off. They want to throw, do like five damage with their fan dagger and get this shield talisman to stop working. Well, the thing is, is that if you swap just from having Crimson Tier plus two to, say, the sword insignia, you're losing about 150 HP, but this is going to get you to where like you're only losing about 20 HP per downscale, right? So th this is perhaps overkill, but I like having this because I really don't like people throwing fan daggers at me. Now, my last two slots, generally speaking, are going to be more offensively minded when looking up and then defensively minded when looking down. So the reason I have it like this is that 
If you're using something that uses a lot of stamina, say like Great Spears or Spears, something like that, then the Turtle Talisman will make it to where you get your stamina back quicker, which is very nice. And then obviously the Shard of Alexander is extremely good, and this for most people is going to be a mainstay, like they're not going to really be swapping off of this, which is why it's all the way over here in Talisman 4. Essentially the way I have it is that since getting down to your Talisman 1 slot is the fastest because it takes the fewest inputs, this is going to be the talisman slot I am the most likely to swap consistently. I'm going to be swapping my main two the majority of the time, and then I can swap off all four if need be. But the last two are going to be ones that are not going to be swapped as often, so they're going to be further away in the menu, meaning that I'm going to leave these stationary the majority of the time. But if need be, or if I choose to, I can swap these to something else. Another thing as well is that I've made it to where with trigger presses, with left trigger presses, up at the top of my menu I have extremely fast access to cockroach mode. So it's not just having royal remains really close by, but it also can be the red feather, blue feather, blessed dew, and then this one is entirely optional. This is a, a pretty risky uh, talisman to run, but a scorpion charm in correlation to what elemental damage you do. This is perhaps the most practical on a coated sword build because that does full holy damage, but essentially the, the buff from this is not quite as high as it is in PvE, but the damage negation drop is going to be just as painful as it is in PvE, aka they hate these charms and made them worse than they needed to be, but when you're at that low of HP, the buffs that you already have are going to stack in a way where this, even though it has a lower amount of damage in PvP, is going to still be adding quite a lot. So if you're at, say, like the higher range of 16 to 20% HP, you can put this on if you don't think your opponent will be able to one-shot you from that range, and that way you just get a straight damage bonus. A little bit further down, I have certain talismans if, say, I need higher robustness, focus, or immunity. These are not going to be as quick to swap to because it is not going to be quite as common as a situation as needing more damage or needing to swap to, say, the dagger or hammer talisman, something like that. But essentially, you're going to fight a lot of people that are using frost, bleed, scarlet rot, stuff like that, sleep. You're going to want to have these somewhat close by at the very least. And then we're also going to have some other useful talismans. These are not getting swapped to near as often, so they're further down in the menu. And then these here are mostly for hosting. Getting backstabs is really easy as a host. A whole bunch of things are going to die if you're the host. So getting back a little bit of HP and FP, these are things to consider more so if you are hosting a lot. As an invader, they will still work, just not as often, so perhaps not worth your time. And then, like I said before, we have a full click to Crimson Seeds. And then down here are going to be all of the talismans that have a good purpose, a good reason to use, but they're not going to be swapped to so much that I want them to be that close to my inventory. Now, let me actually put this sacrificial twig up. It's kind of messing up my inventory. Uh, I'm a bit OCD. I like having it to where every last slot is taken up. Like, I don't like having it to where there's empty slots. You don't have to do that. It's just how I like to do it. So we have all of the different ones that are going to increase a stat by five. We're also going to have the America Sword Seal, uh, because this is the only one that gives you arcane. Uh, we're going to have the other defense ones down here, and the reason is is because I'm not swapping to these as often as the magic one, but I still want them in the build. We're going to have a couple of the other talismans that have a place and purpose. The one that reduces your skill FP is going to be great, especially when casting Holy Ground, because Holy Ground costs so much FP. These are going to be ones that are stealthy. Uh, you're going to have your exaltations. If you're fighting someone that is, say, bleeding you or poisoning you, if you throw these on, even though you're the one, you're not the one that's causing those things, this is still going to be a really big deal because you're going to get that bonus as well. Also, if you're at a lower amount of HP, say like 70% of your max HP or less, then you can throw on the Glintstone Blade and then use a healing spell or especially an HP regeneration spell. Because this is going to make it cost about 30% less FP, but obviously your maximum HP is being reduced. So this is going to be great for, say, casting Blessings Boon or Bestial Vitality, one of the HP regeneration spells, and making sure that you spend as little FP as possible. Because especially if you're playing at 
meta level or below, you kind of can't afford to put much into mind, if anything. So being able to make it to where you make as good of use of your FP as possible is extremely valuable. Now, the setup that I'm running for when it comes to weapons on my main character as of right now is this right here. This is a very simplified menu in terms of how many weapons are here. It is a singular block, there is no scrolling up or down. While you are limiting yourself quite a bit by having this pretty dumb uh, r limitation on yourself, it is something that I like to do because I like how it looks and it helps me focus. While you can have a bazillion swaps like I do, there is a power in something being extremely concise. So while I could easily slap on like another 30 or 60 weapons, me keeping it to this helps me think better, so I like this. So we have a couple different ideas going on, right? So essentially, this setup is going to be accounting for a couple different things. So the main, bu the main idea behind what I have going on right now is that I'm going to have the Raptor's Talon in my main hand. And the reason is, is that, like a video I put out recently, Southpaw is extremely strong for a couple reasons. If you have a buff on your left hand weapon that you're two handing, and then if you swap your right hand, you will keep that buff on your left hand weapon, so you can swap back to two handing it and keep that buff. But also what it's going to do is, considering that I'm essentially always going to be on the Raptor's Talons, or whatever you chose your right hand to be, Essentially, these important swaps that I've designated are always going to be that amount of ticks away, and it's always going to be that amount to get back to it. So if you have a bunch of weapons that could be considered main weapons in your setup, right? So like I have two scimitars, two S-stocks here, having different Ashes of War for different situation, but also some different weapons through here that you may power stance these, you may two-hand these as well. If you needed to swap to, say, the Halberd to get a really fast running R1, well, the amount of ticks changes based on what weapon you're, you're looking at. So what I like doing is with this in my main hand, which is extremely practical, because having a support weapon in your main hand or a support item, say, like a Spiral Horn Shield, is going to give you a bonus and then also allow you to do a very consistent swap to those things. The reason I prefer Endure is because I like having a non-Endure Ash of War on my main weapon, but I'm also not the biggest fan of having to swap to Endure in the moment. Usually, Endure is needed immediately, so I personally like doing this. So essentially what this here allows me to do, let me just swap my talismans back to my normal setup. So essentially what I like doing here is this will allow me to get that Keen Sword Spear very quickly, which is going to allow me to get that beautiful running R1 very nicely, right? All the way as a trigger press with the left finger is going to be a Stormhawk Axe. If you guys remember from last episode, I said it's very important, regardless of your build, to have a get off me tool somewhere close to your main swap. And considering that it is a trigger press to get us there, it is still one press even though it's about three tiles away. We also have Hand of Melania. While we usually have to do two inputs once we're in the menu to get to it, the reason is is that this doesn't have enough hyper armor to be able to just like immediately swap to it and while you're getting hit, have it come like go and do all of its its nasty business. Usually this is something that you're gonna set up around a corner or use after you have used an endure. So that way you're actually able to tank it because while this does have hyper armor, it's not as much as you would think. You're able to get hit out of it by most jump attacks and other things that do a similar amount of poise damage. So usually it takes a little bit of setup, say like you're hiding around a corner or the opponents are coming up an elevator, something like that. And then if I need it in the moment and I'm say like on my scimitar, I can go to one handing it, endure, and then go for it. And this is going to make the part of the setup that is the most vulnerable a lot less vulnerable. Also, one tick away from our talons are going to be a parry option. Uh, the, parry, the parry of the buckler has a unique parry, but I have golden parry on it because I want to be able to use it at a range. Golden Parry having that extremely extended hitbox means that you can actually outspace with Golden Parry and keep from getting punished as hard, so that's definitely good. And then as a right trigger press away is a Great Bow. The Great Bow class of weapons with Golem Arrows are perhaps the strongest invasion weapons in the entire game, 
and it's twofold. It's because golem arrows are extremely powerful, being able to use something that has an AoE, like this, right? And then also not having the reload animation of a Ballista or Jar Cannon. But also, there is an interesting thing you can do when you're taking a high enough fall that you do what I call breaking your knees. Let's see. That's not high enough. We need to be higher. Give me one second as I get a little bit higher on this. Okay, so from this height, we should have to uh, use the Great Bow to keep from breaking our knees. If we fall... Okay, as you can see, I call that the knee breaking animation. If we go up there while one handing our great bow and then take that fall and press either R1 or R2 as we are falling, we are going to use this animation right here, which is going to prevent us from breaking our knees. This is extremely helpful for being able to run away from a group of people because oftentimes they're not going to. If I could make this jump, that would be great. We would be doing quite well if I was able to make this jump, but, you know, of course we're recording, so I'm not hitting it. <laughs> but uh, essentially, people are oftentimes going to be chasing you, and if you're able to make a high fall and then not be stuck in that animation, you're going to gain quite a bit of distance on them. So watch this, right? Falling. And there you go. You kept from breaking your knees. This is super, super good to have at the ready. So being able to swap to it like that and then be able to pull it off is extremely valuable. Now, when it comes to some of the other stuff I have in here, uh, I have a full row of Stormhawk axes up here at the front. Obviously, you don't need that. One is perfectly fine if you design your inventory to account for you only having one. But I like having this row so that if I am using what is normally going to be in my left hand and my right hand, right? Say I'm using my claymore in my right hand. It is the same input to get that Stormhawk axe, which is extremely valuable. Some other stuff in here is going to be a keen sickle. The reason that this is here is because a sickle is going to be a fantastic finishing weapon. Assuming, say, someone's at below like 200 HP, a dagger is unreactable with a lot of its moves. And because it is a sickle, if they are blocking with a shield, more damage will make it through the shield, meaning that they can't just infinitely block a physical damage dagger. And then also, Keen is going to cause Ashes of War that you wouldn't think would scale the best with Keen to do so, actually. Uh, there's a video out there that explains this. I'm not able to explain it all that well, really. But for some reason, things such as Thunderbolt are going to do more damage on a high dexterity Keen character than it will on a Lightning Infusion. So that's interesting. Uh, and also you would be able to buff this as well if you chose to with, say, like a, a drawstring bundle or something like that. These six slots here are mostly going to be for things that I don't really want to swap to, but we might have to based on the opponent. Obviously, there are going to be people that are playing this game intentionally to make you feel bad about yourself, and so sometimes you need something extremely powerful to be able to deal with them. The point of the St. Trinas being here is that, while I am not able to use them right now because of the 14 intelligence requirement, I can do this right here and go up to 14 intelligence with the Stargazer heirloom. And this will allow me to pull out something that has sleep on it. And sleep is a fantastic counter to people that have really bad latency or lag. Now granted, these weapons aren't amazing because they are literally like a ruler. They're so short. But this is going to be a fantastic option when all you're doing is phantom hitting your opponent and eventually putting them to sleep and allowing you to get a couple of free hits is going to be extremely powerful. So that is one consideration on here. We also have power stanced Naginatas as well. So obviously this is a ridiculously powerful setup. I don't like pulling it out on people, but sometimes when somebody is very intentionally trying to ruin your day by playing Elden Ring the video game, sometimes you need to give them the proverbial middle finger. And that is exactly what this is here for. So I recommend if you are somebody that does not enjoy using optimal weapons or just like brain dead weapons like power stance spears, have them on your build anyway because it feels better to give someone the virtual middle finger for trying to be a dickhead than it does to lose to them because you were using a hammer, for example. And then finally, I do have the setup right here to do the chainsaw glitch. The chainsaw glitch, you absolutely do not need to be able to do this glitch if you do not want to. Obviously, a ton of people are going to have a problem with me having this on the build, which I understand it is a glitch, and it is also insanely powerful if you know how to do the glitch. I don't know if I'm going to get it 
here while I'm on camera because uh, it is a frame perfect input. But essentially, if you do get this glitch off, it is going to effectively one shot anybody that is nearby. And the reason that I have this is because there are going to be people that are using other glitches of their own, such as the epitaph glitch. Um, the epitaph glitch, oh dang, got it pretty quickly. So yeah, this has a ridiculous range, like it's reaching borderline almost all the way over to where those ruins are right there. But the thing is, is that there are going to be people that AFK farm in this game, but not actually. They're actually still very much still at their controller and dodging, say, your arrow shots and stuff like that. They're just doing it not for any runes or anything like that. They're doing it to make you mad because that is funny to them. Or it could be someone using the epitaph glitch, making it to where essentially all elemental damage is null and void, and all you can do to them is physical damage. When people are exploiting and doing stuff like that, Sometimes the best thing you can do is essentially tell them the proverbial fuck you and then block them. So I don't like that I have this on the build. I would prefer that we were playing a game where glitches were not so widespread as they are because they are on the rise. People are starting to glitch more and more. And I'm not talking about just the chainsaw glitch. I'm talking about other glitches that are much, much easier to do, meaning that they are going to have a much wider reach than this this setup but sometimes this is literally your only option when someone is hiding inside of a boss fog and you cannot reach them with a single thing so i i understand if this makes people angry but it's my decision to be able to uh deal with people that are cheating or glitching or bug abusing so that is something you get to make your own decision on obviously my decision's obvious i would rather be able to beat them than not and then here are going to be slots that I'm not really swapping to quite as much. Obviously, you're going to need some useful things that are kind of in awkward spots that you're not really going to be swapping to. So the Frenzy Flame Seal, because I am not a Faith character, this is by far going to be the best seal, considering it has no weight, no requirements. You can just keep this in your back pocket and then swap to the Faith Talisman as you need to, to be able to use any of the low-costed Faith spells, such as Vitality for HP regen, one of these for some extra defenses to a given stat. Uh, based on my example from before, if you're using both the Spell Drake Talisman and the Pearl Drake Talisman, and then put, say, Magic Fortification on as well, then you will reach about 19% magic defense and by that point it's actually pretty significant like that's that's nice i i definitely enjoy having that as an option on the build and then you will also have the spiral horn shield i i would like to have had space for the twin bird shield but <laughs> i could fit it right here rather than one of these two shields it's just that this is how i decided to do it um, I, I'm not heeding my own advice from the last episode, technically, but it's okay. I, I, underst I, I have those on like every other build I have, it's just on this particular setup I'm doing as of right now, I don't. But, yeah, you, could, you should definitely fit the Twin Bird Shield on this, the Icon Shield, stuff like that. Um, and then also, I personally like having the Jar Cannon or Ballista, because even though with Golem Arrows, the Great Bow is generally just better, the thing is, is that if you have something that you are able to fall off of, say like right here, this should be close enough, the recoil will knock you off and cause you to not do the reload. So if you're, say, in the Halleck Tree where there's a bunch of guardrails and stuff like that, you can use this to prevent yourself from having to do the reload animation over and over. And it's especially useful if it's something that you can jump onto with like one jump, right? I think this is not close enough. I think that I will actually just eat the animation. Yeah, so essentially you have to set it up to where like your feet are like really close to coming off. This should be close enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially your heels need to be poking off the back of whatever you're trying to fall off of. And if you have that to work with, a ballista or a jar cannon, a jar cannon, a jar cannon becomes much better. So it's it's especially useful if say you run out of golem arrows because obviously you only get 30. But if you combine that with these AoE bolts as well, then you effectively have 70. So even though this is a much more limited weapon, uh, it's still going to be great to have on a build because it will effectively increase your AoE bolt da uh, not damage, your bolt capacity by more than double, which is extremely valuable. And here we are on my level 80 faith character. 
Now, this character, I have farmed everything legitimately, and it is one of my favorite builds for that reason. Extremely fun rune level, extremely fun knowing that I worked for all of the things that I have. But the thing is, is that my weapon inventory is a little bit of a mess right now. So we have a pretty decent setup going on here. Uh, but the problem is, is that the further you go down, the more apparent it becomes that I did not actually sort these at all. So we're going to have to fix that. And then we have a fairly decent armor inventory. Essentially up here, the first row is going to be what I have actually designed things around. Now, I made a pretty bad mistake and did not get the full bloom set before uh, Lindell got destroyed. If you want the full bloom armor set, which you should, then you need to farm that before the illusion Godfrey boss, uh, before you kill Malaketh, because it they will all vanish after you've done that for that playthrough, which is very bad. So I'm going to have all of these fashion options, but I always have Royal Remains one tick away. Now I'm probably going to change it from being on my right to my left. I think I will like that more. Uh, so we're going to change that. And my talisman setup is actually extremely neat. I'm going to show this talisman setup here in just a second, but let me take a moment to fix this weapon, weapon inventory. Alrighty, I will be perfectly honest, I just spent about an hour farming for a couple extra upgrades and a couple weapons I didn't have that I realized I wanted, but essentially, these inventories are going to be a little bit more complicated than what I showed on the dexterity character. When it comes to the armor, the armor is the same. I'm going to restructure it to be more so on the left side rather than the right. Uh, I personally think I will prefer that. But when it comes to the talismans, essentially the way that this is working is sort of a diagonal grid of, uh, of ideas right here. So we have the same four swaps up to having the hyper mode talismans all the way up here at the top. But essentially how it's working is that we're also going vertically too. And so considering that these are staggered in a diagonal line, it means that each single one of these is essentially going to have four D-pad presses that are extremely close. And if I want to go full incantation mode, all the way over here at the side is going to be my full caster setup right here. So these four right here, right? So I can do that or I can run my more uh, balanced approach, right? And so all of the really good stuff is really close by. And considering that I don't have a dupe stash of Crimson Seed Talismans on this character, I have the Crimson Seed both very close to my Crimson Amber Medallion and my Shield Talisman, meaning that I can swap this to the, to the Talisman, or if I want the extra HP with the Crimson Amber Medallion, then that means that I would need to keep this on and then also use the Crimson Seed, in which case I can just momentarily swap over the Ritual Shield and then swap back to it. Down here is going to be a lot of the same things that you saw before, uh, but just out of the way, right? So we have all of these down here. And now this inventory is quite a lot more to take in than... Uh, what I had shown for my dexterity character. But I am proud to say that every last ounce of this has been gotten in a single playthrough of Elden Ring. And so, yes, I farmed all three of these. Yes, it took me two hours to farm these clean rot swords. That was very annoying. Um, but essentially, here I'm going to try and break this down as quickly as I can because it, it's not, it, it's a lot to take in. So, whenever you're starting. Let's say your hands are empty, right? Whenever you have nothing in your hand, essentially the thing it always defaults is the top leftmost tile. And the reason that I have the Misericord in this tile is because if I am in a situation where I have no weapons on my character for some reason, the question you have to ask yourself is, what is the best tool for getting away from your opponents and being as undamageable as possible? Well, it's going to be a dagger with Bloodhound Step. So the Misericord is not only going to be fantastic with Bloodhound Step for getting away from your opponents, but if they are overcommitting, then you can try and go for a backstab, in which case the Misery Cord is going to do obscene damage. Uh, we have a similar idea in terms of using our main hand weapon in our offhand and then using a main hand in Deer Fist. So if I were to set up my inventory real quick, say the Flaming Strike... Uh, Shamshu right here. I can have my fire buff, for example, 
and then if I choose to swap to Blasphemous Blade, I can go for that Ash of War. And would you look at that? I can go back to my Cestus, and I still have the buff. And my Cestus is... my All of my Cestus swaps are on this line, right? So all the way at the top, similar to my Dexterity character, we have our Get Off Me tool. I recommend when it comes to the general ideas of whatever you're doing that you keep the general idea of what you want to swap to uh, consistent across all of your builds. So having my go-to get off me tool all the way at the top is going to make it to where I m mentally make that connection with, oh, pressing the left trigger equals my get off me tool, right? And making that sort of like neural network in your brain to be able to recognize what you need to go to very quickly. We also have a Bloodhound Step uh, Sacred Clean Rot Thrusting Sword. This is going to be for when we need to essentially pester somebody, essentially be a mosquito and be very difficult to hit or try to finish somebody off. I don't think Blasphemous Blade needs an introduction. It is ridiculous. Uh, an Endear Cestus, or I, I really wanted Spiked Fist, but I realized a little too late while I was farming a second ago that I accidentally locked myself of, out of being able to get it this playthrough. My Lendell is already Ash, and you cannot get it uh, once it is so, so I'm going to have to get that in New Game Plus. So for right now, the Spike Cestus will do just fine. Essentially, this is going to allow us to Endure into that Get Off Me tool or anything else that I want to do. I can... I can use the Endure and then go back to the main weapon that I've decided to use, right? That'll work as well. Also, similar to our Dex character, one tick down from our Cestus is my parry option, in which case I will be able to just take the Repost with the Misericord, or I can press the trigger or something similar and just get to a weapon really quickly. Uh, so, obviously, a Faith character has a lot of extra... Ashes of War and interesting stuff you can use. So we have a lineup of things that will be more niche. So they're a little bit further away from the Cestus, but they are still good. Um, the Ash of War on the Black Knife is pretty ridiculous if you manage to hit somebody with it. Because not only does it do crazy damage, but it is also going to do damage over time. So if you're in a situation where your opponent is fighting some random other person or PvE, that is extremely good. This will turn off their Estus, even if it Phantom hits. And also, Scythes are pretty good. Uh, they're not amazing per se, but they're, they're still good weapons. And then having the ability to turn off their Crimson Tears is extremely valuable. And the Cranial Vessel, this is good for ledging people. Say you're on one of the narrow rafters in the Halig Tree or something like that. Anywhere where you can kill someone with a well-timed attack that will send them flying. You could use Rejection, but since this is a Faith build, you're kind of uh, pressed for slots, right? Because you have a lot of different incantations you could use that are perhaps more applicable to your build. So I like having this. And then as a trigger press away, we have another great bow. Now granted, the Erd Tree bow is quite a bit worse than the other bows, in all honesty. So I personally don't recommend using this. The reason that I am using it is because it is the only one that has stat requirements that I can work with without having to put on a talisman or something like that. And when you have to swap to it quickly, this is extremely helpful. And just to show you, I'm currently using arrows that are easy to buy. But yes, I have been farming golem arrows, and I am currently just shy of 200. Tune into the streams if you want to join me on our journey to 630 golem arrows. Whether I'm streaming on YouTube or Twitch, I do this quite frequently. And so that is what we are doing with our life. Epic. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what's going on with our main hand and deer. The, the, this lineup of stuff right here all the way down to this Spiral Horn Shield, are swaps for our second hand, where we're going to have our Misery Cord. Golden Epitaph to be able to use that beautiful buff. You have the Grafted Blade. If I put on the Omen Smirk Mask, I will be able to use the Ash of War on this to be able to get that, uh, that 5 to every single stat, and then I can swap back to this. And for a minute, I will have plus 5 to all of my stats, which is very nice. Uh, I also have a pulley crossbow. I've not farmed to have sleep bolts, but eventually I will. So this will be good for uh, fighting people that are extremely latent. We have a holy ground twin night shield for HP regeneration. Uh, ignore Thop's barrier. I'm just kind of memeing, honestly. This is here so we can make it to where our resistances are higher. 
Then down here at the bottom, we have some horizontal lines. These are the seals that I have currently that I would consider using. The other ones are either not going to have an effect or they're also going to have too high of a faith requirement or something similar. So these are the ones I can use and will use. Now, these weapons here are going to be the left hand for our power stance options. So for this character, something that we are going to be doing is running the Mikulin Blade with a broadsword. This was originally the coated sword, however, I realized that it was not doing as much damage as a Mikulin sword with the broadsword. So both of these have Sacred Blade on them, right? Mikulin Sword has it as its baseline. And then, as you can see over there, the damage on these is quite nice. It is it is very, very nice damage. Um, so this is going to be super strong. And yes, every single weapon you see in here that has Sacred Blade, there's like six or seven in total. I have used Lost, Lost Ashes of War for those. I used a Lost Ashes of War for the Storm Assault. Uh, actually, this us stock is messing something. Um, this one was not going to have uh, Sacred Blade. It was going to have that Ash of War that buffs your weapon with the sacred effect anyway but it's like you just stand there and apply it to yourself um i will do sacred blade if the buff is the same size but i think actually the holy damage gained from that other one that i can't think of the name of is actually a larger buff so i will be uh testing that out and going with it so yeah all of these weapons from like this row up is like the stuff that we will be two-handing or using as a power stance or something like that with our main hand this is like our main block of weapons right here. Farming these was not fun. This took like two and a half hours. That did not feel good. Uh, when we put on the Jar Arsenal and Two Hand, we are able to use the Sacred Great Sword. So if I were to do that right now, we're able to do this. And when you add this with the Golden Epitaph buff, let's actually do that real quick. This damage is insane, right? For a level 80 character. Yeah, we're scratching 850, so that's pretty That's pretty nuts. Um, the Clean Rot Spears are definitely not the best spears that I could use, but Power Stance Spears are so insanely strong that it kind of doesn't matter that I am not using the optimal spear setup. This is still insanely strong. And then we will also have a swap to PSGS. Now, granted, the Tree Spear is here because I have not gone into New Game Plus yet and gotten a second Great Lance. This is more so a Dexterity weapon than it is a Faith weapon. And so it is here for the time being simply because I don't have the option of getting a second Great Lance. So it will swap in the future. Uh, we have an Antsper Rapier that we will be able to use if we put on the Dexterity Talisman. This is going to be our option for dealing with people that have bad latency. Uh, I will have to farm the rope for drawstring greases, which is extremely stupid. Uh, this is going to be insanely, insanely boring farming for this. But hey, this, these are the things that I do as someone who plays too much of this game. This is, uh, this is, <laughs> this is what I do, apparently. Um, we also have the ability to chainsaw if need be right here as well. Like I said, uh, <laughs> viewer discretion advised. I hope I never have to pull this out, but I'd rather give someone the middle finger than lose to somebody who is uh, AFK farming in Celis Rise. So, uh, we also have these options here for getting HP and FP back. Whether we are the invader or the host, if we have these out, this, this one will give us HP back upon something dying, and this one will give us FP back. Um, Sword of Milos also has an FP uh, effect as well, but it weighs more and gives 5 FP in comparison to 4. Something I've not gotten yet and I might need to go into New Game Plus for is the Taker's Cameo and the Spirit Tree Talisman, whatever that one is that you craft from the boss's soul. I should be able to get that one, but I have not yet. But the Taker's Cameo, I think I need to go into New Game Plus for. Uh, that also stacks with these two effects down here. We have the Butt Slam on the uh, <laughs> the axe because you can actually stand near a cliff and go right over with it. And I have a feeling that at some point in the future, I will be able to kill someone with a Butt Slam as a Hail Mary, which will be pretty funny. And also we have Raptors of the Mist on this right here, because in the dungeons that have a chariot, this will allow you to stand in the way of the chariot, and if you time it right, you will not take damage. You will go through the chariot and bounce into the air like if a person had hit you. So that is extremely good. So with that being said, I know that this is a ton to take in. The best way to look at it is 
these are kind of in lines and in boxes. So all of this is to swap from Endear in the main hand, from the Misericord to the Spiral Horn, is to swap to for our second hand right here. This right here is going to be our seal slot. And then this right here is either going to be our offhand power stance weapon, or it's going to be any of these in this window, right? And this window is also perfectly capable of being my main hand slot as well. It's just that it would be my offhand slot if I was using this line for my Endear Cestus. My incantations are set up in a way where I'm mostly doing fire damage as of right now with some supportive spells, but that's not really the point of this video. You're not really, like, swapping these on the fly because you kind of have the 10 or so set, and then you just have to do it in your Sight of Grace to swap those, so they kind of don't count for this video. But, yeah, I know this is extremely rambly, but hopefully you have stuck with me this entire time. If you have, you are insane. Maybe as insane as I am. Uh, but yeah, man, this is kind of what goes into menu setup. I will be honest, I spend way too much time thinking about how I can make my inventories better and better. And so hopefully, with the easier dexterity example from before, or even this maniac setup, you can understand what I'm going for. And yeah, just having an idea of what you want a specific lineup from a weapon to be is extremely valuable. Right, And you don't have to have a bazillion weapons like me. You can have it just be like 15 things that are in like these first slots right here. You're, you're going to get like easily 15 usable weapons for your build in a run-through of Elden Ring. Right, You can have it be something that small, and it will work just fine. There is a liberty to having a simple inventory. It's just that I'm at the point with my swapping and whatnot that this is simple to me, <laughs> that, that this is what I consider simple. But I know that most people will not be like that. So if you've made it to this point, I apologize for the amount of stuttering I've done. It is very difficult not stuttering when you're recording so much vo uh, talking. Like if I canceled for every single stutter I did, I would literally never finish making this video. But I hope you guys have enjoyed. I hope you learned something. And I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.